This video will help you understand how federal income tax brackets work so you can better understand why you pay the amount of money you do in taxes. If you don't know who I am, my name is Chris Dime. I'm a financial planner out of Edmonds, Washington, and I specialize in working with folks to and through retirement. After doing this whole financial planning thing for over a decade, I've had thousands of conversations and it's become abundantly clear from many of these conversations that one of the most confusing topics out there is how the US federal tax system works. Fundamentally, I don't think many people understand how their income is taxed, at least at the federal level. And this is because I hear things like, well, I don't wanna make more money because then I'll be in a higher tax bracket. Or I'll hear things like, I wish my bonus wasn't taxed at such a higher rate than my salary. Or more commonly for Washington state tech focused people would be, I'm gonna hold off on selling my stock grants because I don't wanna pay more in taxes. And if you think all these statements are correct, you are in a safe place and you're gonna learn a lot because they're actually all wrong. So in today's video, we'll demystify how federal income tax brackets apply. So let's jump in. First and foremost, this video is not meant to demystify how state income taxes work. Luckily in Washington state, I don't have to be an expert on state income taxes because there is no state income tax in Washington state. So this video may or may not apply philosophically to how your state chooses to tax residents of your state. On the federal level, however, everybody gets hit with these taxes, so it's gonna apply one way or the other. On the federal level, there's two main things I think would be helpful to walk away from this video with. Number one, income is income is income and number two federal taxes which i might just refer to here on out as just taxes in general are on a marginal basis so let's first start with understanding what it means that income is income is income regardless of how you are compensated 100 percent salary 100 percent bonus 100 percent commission tips self-employment income restricted stock units overtime pay etc all of those items are considered income and they are taxed as income. Regardless of the source of your income, for the most part, they're all taxed the exact same way. You add up all of your income at the end of the year, then you apply it to the federal income tax brackets. So salaries aren't taxed more than restricted stock units, which aren't taxed more than tips, etc. We'll touch on how federal income tax brackets apply later on in the video, but just know that 100 grand of salary is no different than 100 grand of bonus. It's all considered income to the IRS. Now there are some forms of income that are taxed a little bit differently where they might still be considered income, but income is not income is income. The most popular form of income that receives preferential tax treatment, uh, AKA taxed at a smaller amount would be long-term capital gains. Capital gains from the sale of a capital asset like stocks or property, et cetera, are either taxed as short-term capital gains or they're taxed as long-term capital gains. AKA you bought some piece of property for this much money and you sold it ideally for more, but whatever the more than amount is, is considered your gain. However much money you made off of the sale of that capital asset. Your capital gain on that transaction will be considered short term if you only held the property for 365 days or less. Whereas long-term capital gains apply whenever you've held the capital asset for at least a year and a day, AKA 366 days or more, unless there is a leap year involved, at which time I think you're supposed to wait just another extra day so that you might not be able to sell it the day after the anniversary of holding this capital asset, but you'd have to hold it for the anniversary plus two days. So basically it's probably best just to wait a couple extra days just to be sure it's considered long-term if you think a leap year is involved. Short-term capital gains are taxed at ordinary income tax brackets, which we'll touch on the brackets shortly, but as it pertains to income as income as income, this would be considered one of those incomes. Taxed the same way as salaries, bonuses, etc. Whereas long-term capital gains are taxed at cheaper rates, somewhere between zero and 20%, 15% is generally a good planning number. And I'll link above to an explainer video that breaks down how long-term capital gains is taxed in conjunction with ordinary income if you have both types of income throughout the tax year. There are also some forms of non-taxable income or tax-free income. And these would be things like um, alimony payments from divorces that occurred after 2018, inheritances, cash gifts, etc. And then a lot of veterans out there have disability or VA disability payments. Those are also tax-free. But sometimes your disability income is tax-free and sometimes it's taxable depending on who is paying for the insurance policy. And on the topic of alimony, um, also child support payments are tax-free as well. But as far as like salaries, bonuses, stock compensation, et cetera is concerned, income is income is income. It doesn't matter what the source is, it all gets added together to achieve a final number, which is called your gross income for the tax year. 
Now, what does it mean for your income to be taxed on a marginal basis? A marginal tax system would be in direct contrast to like a flat tax system, whereby let's say no matter how much money you make in the US, your income is taxed at a flat rate of 30%. So everybody and their mother pays 30% in taxes based on however much money they made. So for example, if you made 100 grand, your tax bill this year is 30 grand. If you make a million dollars, your tax bill is 300,000. Now, we're not gonna wade into the political waters as to whether or not a flat tax system is you know, more ethical, but ultimately the US federal system uses a marginal basis. And what that means is there are clearly defined brackets of income based on your tax filing status that correlate with a particular percentage of taxes you'll owe for any money within a particular bracket. And the more money you make, the higher the percentage of taxes that's applied to said bracket. So as opposed to a flat tax, the US marginal tax system is more progressive, meaning as you progress up in the income bands, you'll pay a higher proportional percentage of your income to taxes. Let's pull up the 2025 married filing jointly uh, income tax brackets for a quick uh, walkthrough. So based on these brackets, any income that's applied to your tax return between zero and $23,850 is taxed at a 10% tax rate. If you made more than $23,850 for the tax year, then you're gonna also fall into the next bracket. And any money between roughly 24 grand and 97 grand is gonna be taxed at 12%, and so on and so on and so on. And once you've calculated all of the income taxes applicable to brackets that your income falls into, you add up all those together, and that's your federal tax liability. For a uh, real world applicable example, let's take a married filing jointly couple that makes 300,000. So we already talked about, they're gonna pay 10% on the first $23,850 of income uh, at a 10% rate is gonna equal 2385 in taxes on the first bracket. But they made more than that, so we have to keep going up the brackets. On the next $73,100 of income, which is the income that would apply between that next bracket, they're gonna pay a 12% rate, which equals $8,772. On the next $109,750, which is the money between the next bracket and that 22% bracket, they're gonna pay 22% on that income, which is $24,145. And then the rest of their income falls into the 24% bracket, but they don't pay 24% on all the income within that bracket because they only made up to 300 grand. So you take the bottom of that bracket up to their income, which is 300 grand, which is about $93,300, and they'll pay a 24% tax rate on that income, which totals to $22,392 in tax. You add up all the subtotals that apply to each marginal bracket, and you get a total tax of $57,694. So in this example, colloquially, they might say, we are in the 24% bracket, but their entire income was not taxed at 24%. Only around 93,000 of it was because if they were fully in the 24% tax bracket, and let's say 24% tax is applied to their 300 grand of income, well then they would be paying the IRS $72,000 in taxes. So it's a bit misleading to say, we are in the insert blank tax bracket under the auspices that all of your income is being taxed at that rate. It's not true. Most of your income for the $300,000 couple will be applied to other brackets that are much lower than 24%. Now the tax nerds in the audience might be saying, oh no, what about deductions? And the nerds are right. So deductions would apply to your $300,000 of income where you actually don't have to pay income taxes on all 300 grand. There are two prime tax deductions we see for taxpayers, uh, which is primarily uh, the standard deduction, which takes your 300 grand down to a smaller level. And then there's also 401k contributions of we'll say 20,000 bucks or so, where you can further reduce your income that you have to pay taxes on. Now you still made 300 grand, but you get a tax deduction of we'll call it 50 grand. So really only 250,000 is being applied to the brackets we just walked through. This ultimately results in a smaller amount of tax owed this year. Now there's pros and cons to doing pre-tax 401k contributions because it'll be income taxable on the back end. So pros and cons there, but philosophically that's how it works where a deduction reduces your taxable income so you pay taxes on a smaller amount of money. And thus you could argue you have more money to go and do things with. Now there's a lot of other tax deductions out there you can take advantage of. Those are just the two primary ones I see. Uh, tax deductions is definitely beyond the scope of today's video. So we've got a few more minutes. So let's debunk some of the tax myths you see out there. 
The first one we talked about in the beginning of the video is I don't want to make any more money because then I'll be in a higher tax bracket. So we just talked about making more money and paying some more in taxes is a good problem to have. Just because you make a certain amount of money doesn't mean all of your income is now taxed at that higher bracket. Sure, you're in the you know 24% tax bracket in the previous example, but only a very small portion of your income is taxed there if you've just climbed into that bracket. So all else being equal, you want to make more money every single year, regardless of the tax bracket that that income is going to fall into. You don't start losing money to taxes just because you make more money. The second big tax myth you see out there is people thinking that their bonus is taxed at a higher rate than their other compensation. And this ultimately plays into how HR does withholding, not how the IRS taxes your income. Your bonus, your salary, and your stock compensation all flow into the same lump sum of income you'll eventually have to pay taxes on when you do your return. HR just might conveniently choose to withhold more of your bonus for taxes because they know as you climb those brackets, you may or may not have accounted for withholding more of your compensation for taxes. But philosophically, salary, bonus, et cetera, it's all taxed at the same rate, if you will. It's at least all taxed on the same schedule. The IRS doesn't differentiate between salary and bonus compensation. If you have a problem with that, you could totally just go speak to HR about it, but odds are they're probably doing you a favor because if you're getting a big bonus that is being withheld at a higher rate, um, that's probably because you're climbing the income brackets and they want to prevent you from needing to stroke a big check to the IRS when you file your return. And it turns out you under withheld on taxes throughout the year. The last one I hear a lot, especially in the Seattle area, is the desire to hold on to stock compensation or stock grants or restricted stock units because you don't want to pay more in taxes uh, when you sell the stock. And while, yes, a capital gain may or may not apply when you do sell that stock, the day that the stock grant lands in your account and you have control over that stock, it's fully income taxable. Just like if your company gave you a big cash bonus for the dollar value equivalent of said stock. If you get 100 grand of Microsoft stock plopped into your account on December 1, it's the same thing as if Microsoft stroked you a bonus check for 100 grand. Now, Microsoft people get their bonuses in the fall, but my point is it's the same compensation structure. Now, whether or not you choose to sell the stock or hold on to it, that's going to come with some downstream short-term or long-term capital gains tax effects. And I'll link above here to some ways to strategize around restricted stock units. But to the IRS, it's the same as compensation otherwise. Now, there is a distinct nuance I'll make for um, options that are granted by your company. That would play a role into choosing whether to sell or not. Um, or if you've gotten certain like discounted stock, that could play a role. I'll link above here to some options, tax explainers, and then eventually uh, employee stock purchase plan taxes. But restricted stock units are the simplest one to understand. You get the stock, it's yours to control, it's considered compensation in day one. So from a cost to action standpoint, I'd highly recommend you understand philosophically what's going on with your income and what bracket you are in at the margin. You're not in that bracket for all of your income, you're in that bracket at the margin. This is also gonna be helpful in doing things like math on uh, Roth conversion, et cetera. If you are used to paying effectively 15% or so in income taxes, it would be not wise to assume that any Roth conversions you do are gonna be taxed at that 15% rate. Any moves you're making at the margin, AKA after you've added up all your income and you're gonna do a, a Roth conversion or you're gonna do something that generates income, that income you could easily do math on will be taxed at the margin at a particular rate. So understanding how the brackets work and which brackets you fall into is important to make some good informed tax decisions throughout the year. Hopefully that was helpful. If you have further questions, drop them in the comments below. Get in touch on the website. We'll help you get squared away. Have an awesome rest of your day. We'll talk to you later. Bye.